have you here. We feel, we feel very honored to have you. And why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? And um, we spoke to you last weekend. We love to hear your testimony, um, how you got to where you are today. Well, thank you. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's first of all a great honor uh, to be with you. Uh, I just adore Dr. Perkins. He's a precious human being to me because of his life, his ministry, his work. Uh, and so when he asked me uh, to do anything, I try my best to do it. Um, I'm grateful to be here. Uh, I am uh, a practicing lawyer and have for the last 35 years represented the poor, the condemned, the incarcerated, the marginalized. Uh, and I um, grew up in the church and learned the power of being proximate. For me, faith is about proximity. I think uh, in my church, we learned that to really understand God's grace and God's love, um, we have to be near the cross. We have to be at the cross. So much of the liturgy, so much of the hymns, so much of the theology uh, in the community where I came from was about getting close to those uh, who are suffering, getting close to those who are hungry, getting close to those who have not been fed, getting close to those who have been excluded. And, uh, and, and, and Jesus calls us close. And that question of proximity has shaped my work. Uh, my grandmother was an incredibly important person in my life. Uh, she, she was the daughter of people who were enslaved. And she taught me the importance of faith and witness and proximity, which is why I'm here today in Montgomery. When I was a little boy, uh, my grandmother uh, started doing these things. When integration came to our community, she was worried about how we would navigate this world she didn't understand. And when integration came, I was about nine years old, my grandmother started doing this thing. She started coming up to me and she'd give me these hugs and she would squeeze me so tightly, I thought she was trying to hurt me. And then she'd see me an hour later and she'd say, Brian, do you still feel me hugging you? And if I said, uh, no, she would jump on me again. And after a little while, I learned uh, every time uh, I would see my grandmother, the first thing I would say is, Mama, I always feel you hugging me. And uh, I didn't appreciate what she was teaching me. Uh, she worked as a domestic her whole life. She lived into her 90s. But when she got in her 90s, uh, one day she fell and she broke her hip and she was diagnosed with cancer. <laughs> And uh, she was um, on her deathbed. I was a college student at the time uh, at Eastern University. I saw that you had Dr. Campolo on recently. He was one of my professors. And I left Eastern uh, to be with my grandmother. And it was really painful for me because I knew it was going to be my last conversation with her. And I sat next to her and we prayed and we talked. Her eyes were closed. She wasn't really responding. I wasn't sure she could hear me. And I just sat there holding her hand. And then I knew it was time to go. And I stood up to leave and I was about to take a step. And just as I did, my grandmother opened her eyes and then she squeezed my hand and she looked at me. And uh, the last thing my grandmother said to me, she said, Brian, do you still feel me hugging you? And then she said, I want you to know I'm always going to be hugging you. And in many ways, that's my testimony. I live and work in Montgomery, Alabama, because I believe that some of us have to go to the places where people need to be embraced, where people need to be affirmed. I think we talk a lot about all of the challenges that we see, and we talk about policies and procedures and laws and reforms and strategies and tactics, and all of those things are important. But my testimony this morning is that to really do the important work you just need to get close enough to people who've been pushed down, close enough to people who've been told their lives have no meaning and purpose, close enough to people who are suffering to wrap your arms around them and to embrace them and affirm their dignity, affirm their worth, affirm their value. That's what I think the Gospels teach us to do. And even though I practice law, my real calling is being someone who affirms the humanity and dignity of every person, advocating for God's grace, even in places where people think grace can't be found. And I'm really privileged uh, to do what I do, to, uh, to have the opportunities I've had, uh, including this opportunity to be with all of you uh, this morning. Thank you, Brian. And you have written a um, New York Times bestseller, Just Mercy book, and uh, people can go online and get that if you, if you haven't read it, it's terrific. Um, also, it was turned into a film. 
Just Mercy film. And uh, JP and I watched it this weekend and, uh, and we were totally inspired. So we thank you so much for that. Um, we're going to get, uh, JP, you want to start with any type of introduction for yourself? Oh, not much. Not yeah, I much, got some questions for you. I, I, what's on my mind is a passage in 2 Corinthians. It says, I don't know how we missed it. The God was in Christ. That's the theme of the Bible is, Lo, I come, as it is written in the volume of the book, to do thy will, O Lord. The will of God, God was in Christ, the incarnation, to reconcile us to himself. And he has given unto us, we Christian, born again people, the ministry, the ministry. The ministry is that people might know God and to make him known and love him and work for him forever. The ministry of reconciliation. That's, lo I come, lo I come, Psalm 40. That's back in eternity in the volume of the book, to do thy will, O Lord. Reconciliation is why he came. We were sinners alienated from God. I, why do we react so negative to the main central mission of the gospel? Okay, so Brian, this is one of the honors of my life. I've been trying to like, I was inspired as a third grade dropout to do what I'm doing now. And I was inspired by other people's, my, back my son, hearing the good news of the gospel, that Jesus loved the little children, all the children of the world, brown, yellow, black, and white, they all are precious in his sight. God loved the little children of the world. I was inspired because of others. So I'm inspired by your life. In Latin, Sunday night, I think it was, I was just weeping as I watched God work his way out, work out his will for you and to make you a reconciler in society. So we're just honored to have you. And we want you to just tell your story. Uh, the, the one story that I want to hear that you told us was when you found purpose in your life. Tell us about the time that you um, knew that God had called you to do justice. Yeah, well, um, sure, and I appreciate that. Yeah, I grew up in a poor, racially segregated community. Um, I started my education in a colored school. There were no uh, high schools for black kids when my dad was a teenager. And even though he was smart and hardworking, he couldn't go to high school in our county. And then the lawyers came in and enforcing the Supreme Court's decision in Brown versus Board of Education made them open up the public schools. And because of that, you know, I got to go to uh, high school. I graduated from high school. I went to college. As I said, I went to Eastern uh, College in Pennsylvania. And as a college student, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I was very involved actually in music ministry, I was very involved in sports. I was a philosophy major. It was at Eastern that I met Dr. Perkins. He came to speak, and it was just one of those unforgettable moments when he preached uh, on our campus, and I have uh, been um, so deeply moved ever since. But toward my senior year, I began to um, wonder what would come next, and one day somebody came up to me and said, you know, you are a senior, and you are a philosophy major, and nobody's going to pay you to philosophize when you graduate from Eastern College. And hadn't really thought about what came next. So I started looking into graduate programs in history and English and political science. And I didn't realize at the time that to get admitted to these graduate programs, you have to know something about history, English, or political science. So I kept looking. And to be honest, that's how I found my way to law school. It became clear to me, you don't need to know anything to go to law school. And so I signed up for that. And a few months later, found myself sitting in a classroom at Harvard Law School deeply disillusioned because I went to law school because I was concerned about helping the poor and addressing inequality and social injustice. And it didn't seem like anybody was talking about those issues. 
And so after a year there, I left. I went actually to the School of Government to pursue a degree in public policy. I woke up one morning, two months into that program, really feeling alienated. It seemed like they were just teaching people to maximize benefits and minimize costs. And it didn't matter whose benefits got maximized and whose costs got minimized. And so I went back to the law school deeply uh, despairing. And that's when I took a course uh, that required me to spend a month with a human rights organization um, in Atlanta, Georgia, providing legal services to death row. I prayed about where to go, what to do. And I just felt like God sent me to this organization. And when I was there, I met a community of lawyers in Atlanta who seemed energized by the work they were doing. They got up early every day. They were animated. They were committed. They were focused. And I began to think differently about the kind of lawyer I might become. And I'd been there a week when one of the lawyers said, Brian, we need you to go to death row and explain to one of the people we haven't met that he's not at risk of execution anytime in the next year. And so I couldn't say no. So I, I, I the next day uh, got in my car, drove down to death row. I was very nervous. I was very unprepared. I felt completely overwhelmed. I didn't feel adequate. And I parked my car in the prison. It was the first time I'd ever been to death row, first time I'd ever been in a state prison. And I walked into this prison and they took me back to the visitation room, which was dark and intimidating and challenging. And I was so nervous. And I kept trying to rehearse exactly what I was going to say to this man. And I was pacing back and forth. And finally, they unlocked the door and there stood the first condemned prisoner I'd ever seen. And this man was standing there. And what I remember about him was that he was burdened with chains. He had handcuffs on his wrists. He had a chain around his waist. He had shackles on his ankles. It took them 10 minutes to unchain this man. And when they had him unchained, I walked over and I said, uh, hi, my name is Brian. I'm just a law student. And I started apologizing. I said, I'm sorry, I don't know anything about the death penalty. I'm sorry, I don't know anything about criminal procedure or civil procedure or appellate procedure. I'm sorry, I'm not a real lawyer, but they sent me down here to tell you that you're not at risk of execution anytime in the next year. And as soon as I said that, that man grabbed my hands and he said, thank you, thank you, Thank you. He said, you're the first person I've met in the two years I've been on death row who's not a death row prisoner or a death row guard. And then he said, I've been talking to my wife and kids, but I haven't let them come and visit because I was afraid they'd show up and I'd have an execution date. He said, now because of you, I'm going to see my wife. I'm going to see my kids. He said, thank you, thank you, thank you. And I couldn't believe how even in my ignorance, being proximate, being present, could have an impact on the quality of someone's life. That man and I started talking, and even though I'd only scheduled to be there an hour, one hour turned into two hours, and two hours turned into three hours, we were talking about our lives. He was telling me about his, and I was telling him about mine, and we found fellowship on death row. And I just lost all track of time, and the guards were waiting, and they were getting angry that I hadn't finished the visit. And after three hours, they couldn't take it any longer, so they came busting into the room. And they took this man and they threw him against the wall. They pulled his arms back. They put the handcuffs on his wrists. I saw them wrap the chain around his waist. They put the shackles on his ankles so tightly you could see him struggling. And they were punishing him for being in the room so long. I begged them to be gentler. I said, look, it's my fault, not his fault. But they ignored me. And then they started shoving this man toward the door. And I was looking in horror at the way they were treating him. They were pushing him so unnecessarily, so violently. And they got him near the door and they were about to shove him out when I noticed that this man planted his feet. And the next time when they tried to move him, he didn't move. And that's when this man turned around and he looked at me and he said, Brian, don't you worry about this. You just come back. And then he did something I had never, ever forgotten. I stood there and I watched this man close his eyes. Then he threw his head back and then he started to sing. And he started singing, I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining every day, still praying as I'm onward bound. And then he said, Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Everybody stopped. Uh, the guards recovered and they started pushing this man down the hall where you could hear the chains clanging, but you could hear this man singing about higher ground. And in that moment, God called me. That was the moment I knew I wanted to help condemned people get to higher ground. That's the moment I realized that my journey to higher ground was tied to his journey, that if he doesn't get there, I can't get there. And in an instant, my interest in the law was radicalized. I went back to Harvard Law School. You couldn't get me out of the law library. I needed to know everything about the doctrine and the jurisprudence and the procedures and the mechanism for helping condemn people. And I tell people all the time, 
uh, that if I've helped anybody during my career, it's not because I'm hardworking or smart. That's not because I've done something special or there's anything great about me. If I've helped anybody in my career, it's because I got proximate to a condemned man and heard him sing about higher ground. And in his song, he redeemed and lifted my understanding of God's calling on my life. And when I left that prison, all of these thoughts were coming into my head and God just blessed me. I started thinking about Saul who was imprisoned and challenged and cursed and who did so much wrong and evil and how the gospels would have a very different form if they had executed Saul before he met uh, our Lord on the Damascus road. And it was weaving me. I said, somebody has to represent the Sauls in our world. Somebody has to advocate for those whose redemption is in front of them, who, who's awaiting redemption. And that's why I took uh, great pride in saying, yes, I will stand with the condemned. I didn't think it an offense to God. I thought it was actually a calling from God uh, to associate myself with the condemned and the imprisoned and the neglected and those who are hated. And that has shaped my work. Uh, but it really begins with going into the places where uh, oftentimes we don't want to go. We don't think to go, uh, but where God's grace is, is, is there and, and we meet it there. And that's what happened to me as a law student. And I've been doing this work ever since. Wow, that's a uh, fantastic testimony. Thank you so much for that. Um, this week and last week, we have seen um, upheaval in America like we haven't ha um, seen in a long time. And when we you have never seen nothing like this before in my 90 years. Mm. George Floyd, he's, um, he's, a, he's a man that will go down in history now. Um, when you watch that video of the officer's knee on George's neck, can you share your emotion about that when you watched his life slip away? Yeah, I mean, I think like so many, it's painful uh, and it's made more painful because it's so familiar. Uh, this is not the first time we have seen a black man killed by the police. It's not the first time we have encountered this reality that we've created in this country. And I, you know, we have not freed ourselves from the burden of bigotry and racism. I actually think our country has not called itself uh, to repent around all of these institutional harms. And because of that, we continue to see manifestations of these issues. We're not a free society. I, we, we've created through our long history of racial injustice and racial inequality, a kind of smog that's in the air. And it doesn't matter where you live, whether you live in Oregon or Mississippi or New Hampshire or Alabama, it's in the air and it's polluted the environment. And we haven't talked about things we need to talk about. And it's created this presumption of dangerousness and guilt that gets assigned to Black people. And uh, many of us have had to deal with this presumption. And it doesn't matter how hard you work. It doesn't matter how smart you are. It doesn't matter how dedicated you are. It doesn't matter how faithful you are. It doesn't matter if you are a pastor or if you're a sanitation worker. If you're Black, you go places and you have to navigate this presumption of dangerousness and guilt where it becomes your burden to persuade other people that you're not a threat. And I went to law school. I graduated. I thought, well, with my Harvard Law degree, everything is going to be great for me. And it wasn't but a few years after that. And I was pulled out of my car one night in Atlanta, Georgia, by police officers who, uh, who were suspicious of me just because I'd been sitting in the car for 10 minutes actually organizing papers for a legal case. My apartment, my car, just sitting there. I was listening to something on the radio. And somebody called the police, and these officers came, and I got out to tell them this is where I live. And the officer pulled a gun and said, move, and I'll blow your brains out. And in that instant, I had to raise my hands and say, it's all right, it's okay, it's all right, it's okay. And then I watched these officers uh, conduct an illegal search. They kept me out there. And that incident is a familiar incident to many of us. And it breaks my heart. The next day, I was worried about whether the young Black boys in that neighborhood knew to say, it's all right, it's okay. Because what went through my not mind that night was that if that same thing had happened to me 10 years earlier when I was a young driver at 17 or 18, I might have run. I might have done something that would cost me my life. And it's a lifetime of that that was in my head when I watched this video. 
And the truth is, is that we cannot continue in this place where we menace and target and taunt and torment people simply because of the color of their skin. We have to get away from this place where we abuse power and subject others to violence unnecessarily. And I think that is what has been so enraging uh, to so many people is that we've seen this before and we've done so little in response. And it's amazing to me because we are a capable society. We have shut down the entire nation because we've learned of a virus that is circulating in the world. And the things we have done to protect ourselves from this virus are pretty dramatic. They're pretty extreme. We know how to respond to a serious threat. Uh, we've had other kinds of issues. When there's a hurricane, we do all of these things to minimize risk and threat. Uh, people board up windows, they uh, flee, they uh, take uh, uh, evacuation routes to safety. We know how to respond, but somehow the threat of injustice, of racial inequality, the burden of racial inequality, the, the burden of racial oppression is something we haven't seen as the kind of threat that we need to see, and we don't do anything. And so these incidents continue. And that's what was going through my head, and that's why I think that we are in a unique moment, as Dr. Perkins has said, an unprecedented moment. And the question for me and the calling for me is whether we can turn this moment into a moment, not just of anger and frustration, but a moment of restoration, of repentance, of reconciliation, of repair, to manage this long history of inequality. Uh, we have to talk about the fact uh, that we are a post-genocide society. What we did to native people when Europeans came to this continent was genocide. We killed millions of them. Uh, uh, Dr. Perkins lives in the state of Mississippi. That's a native word. I live in the state of Alabama. That's a native word. We kept their word, but we made the people leave. And we taught, said that they were savages. We used that rhetoric to justify the violence. And we didn't treat them properly. And then we brought uh, millions of enslaved people to this country. And we justified slavery by using this narrative of racial difference. And for me, the great evil of slavery uh, wasn't the involuntary servitude or the forced labor, it was the ideology of white supremacy that we created to justify enslavement. To be a slave owner and to be moral and think of yourself as Christian, you had to make up a narrative, a fiction about the people you were enslaving. You had to persuade yourself that they're not really people. They're not fully human, they're not evolved. They can't do this, they can't do that. They're not worthy, they're less deserving. And that narrative, that ideology, that was the true evil of slavery. And we ended the involuntary servitude with the 13th Amendment, but we didn't end that ideology of white supremacy. And after enslavement, it, it didn't go away. And that's why I've argued slavery doesn't end in 1865, it just evolves. We then had a century of lynchings where black people were pulled out of their homes, menaced, threatened, tortured, hanged, burned, millions fled the South. Uh, to the north and the black people in Cleveland and Chicago and Minneapolis and Los Angeles and Oakland didn't go to those communities as immigrants. They went to those communities as refugees and exiles from terror. And we didn't do a lot better for them there. And then in the 1950s, courageous people of faith began to challenge this racial oppression and they argued for justice. And we saw some things change, but that narrative of racial difference persists. And today we are still contending with it which is why this incident has been so provocative. And I think uh, the other part of this story that I don't think we've paid enough attention to is that you know, law enforcement has often been the face of racial oppression. During slavery, it was the police that would track down black people in the North and West and send them back into slavery. They were empowered to enforce the fugitive slave laws. Uh, after Recon during Reconstruction, it was the law enforcement that stepped back and allowed white militias to take over these governments. During the first half of the 20th century, it was law enforcement that allowed white mobs to come into jails, pull black people out, and lynch them, sometimes on the courthouse lawn. In the 1950s and 60s, it was uniformed police officers that went to the Edmund Pettus Bridge, and while black people were on their knees praying for justice, these officers beat and battered and bloodied them, some to within an inch of their lives. That identity is something that requires some acknowledgement, some repentance. And when I saw that video, what was so provocative to so many people was this unrepentant, uh, this unfeeling indifference to the violence that was being done to that man. And this is why I believe the church has such a critical role to play in this moment. We are called, I think, uh, to make our nation understand, our communities understand, 
uh, that this is the time for repentance. This is the time for uh, confession. This is the time uh, for confronting this long history. And only through repentance, only through confession, can we get to redemption and salvation. I really believe that. Uh, I think we need a truth and justice process in this country. In South Africa, they had truth and reconciliation after apartheid. In Rwanda, they had a truth process after the genocide. When you go to Germany, you see a nation that has been trying to tell the truth about the Holocaust. There are uh, Holocaust memorials all over that country. You can't go 100 meters without seeing the stones placed in front of the homes of Jewish families that were abducted. There's a Holocaust memorial in the middle of Berlin. There are no Adolf Hitler statues in Germany. There are no icons and memorials to the perpetrators of that violence. It would be unconscionable to think that. But in this country, in the region where Dr. Perkins and I live, we have littered the landscape with icons and statues and memorials dedicated to the defenders and, 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 and uh, protectors of enslavement. And it is an unrepentant landscape. And that has to change, I believe, if we're going to get to the kind of redemption. And the church can reassure people who are afraid of of talking about this, who are just fearful. They don't want to talk about race. They don't want to talk about these things. It scares them. And the church can assure them that if we actually confess, if we tell the truth, there is something beautiful on the other side of that. Redemption comes. And we know about redemption. We can actually be witnesses to the power of redemption to uplift and restore and overcome. And that's my view. I actually think there's something better waiting for us in America than anything we've lived today. There's something better. There's something that feels more like freedom and equality and justice than what we've experienced. But to get there, we're going to have to commit to this process of truth telling. We're going to have to overcome this fear and anger and, and confess and then look for our redemption. Wow. The, um, this week has also brought back old wounds from our family and from um, what happened to my father uh, in the Brandon jail. JP, I want to ask you to just share, what did watching that make you feel? Did it make you feel, um, did it bring back wounds of the past? Yeah, yeah. It, 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 it affirmed me, but it also benefited me uh, that when you can identify with the pain of others. And that's what God wants us to do. That's where redemption comes when we enter into when we can see things and and that we can be passionate enough to enter into that feeling and life with them. So uh, so it was it was it was outstanding. The, the other thing that about my life was that when I came out of prison and and got on the way trying to be healed, it was the doctors, it was the nurses, it was the black doctors, the white nurses. Uh, I didn't want to be around especially white people anymore, but they, in an end to their love and compassion for me. They entered into their pain and they became redemptive in my life. That's what it means to have compassion. It's to enter into, every time Jesus come up about compassion, it means that the person was gonna be healed because he was gonna enter into their life in a way that his life given power was going to redeem them. That's what it means for us. Mm -hmm. He have given us the ministry. He have called us. He have sent us to enter into the pain of others. Come unto me. Come unto me. Come unto me. Uh, take my yoke upon you. Learn of me. Uh, it, it's not about my prosperity. It about me taking what would be my prosperity and to enter it into the life of others and become redemptive. And they become then our rejoicing. They become a joy. That's what Paul said to that church that was born in 
the people that brutalize them being converted in, in, into their pain. Pain, redemption, and reconciliation is washing the people's wounds that you afflicted. That's what had happened on, with the Apostle Paul. He was on his way to kill Adonai, but God used him to wash his wounds. He was brutalized in that Philippian jail, but the jailer washed his wounds. That's what it means to be a Christian. It's to enter into the pain of this world. That's why Jesus came. We can be forgiven. That, that, I mean, I, I don't think people see that. Mm -hmm. That a uh, heavier part of what you're saying, Brian, they don't see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They really don't see the joy that could come out of them in and into the pain of others. Yeah. I, I, I think your testimony is that. You, and, and, and I think that's what the mother got to do. The, the mother got to in, in, and give you that love. And, and give you that love. And it's that love that fortifies you to notice your love. Jesus loves me, this I know. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus loves me, this I know. So, Brian, keep on preaching. Uh, I want to ask <laughs> you, Brian, uh, about um, everybody wants to know about, you know, these protests and, and, um, and what's going to happen, you know, after them and why it is. But throughout this week, I have been doing a lot of, of course, reading about you and um, listening to you talk to um, the president about things. But what's going on today is a, and I saw in the New York Times, you said that um, the protests are a symptom of a larger cultural disease. Explain that. Sure. I just think that we haven't created space for people um, to give voice to the pain that Dr. Perkins is talking about and to then uh, kind of go through that pain to the place of redemption. Uh, you know, um, my, my great grandfather was enslaved. And yet he learned to read while enslaved because he had this belief that freedom would come for him one day. He had the capacity to believe things he hadn't seen, which is ultimately what faith is about. Uh, when after emancipation, uh, formerly enslaved people would come to their house and my grandmother told me he would read the newspaper every night. And she loved sitting next to him as he read the newspaper and people got so quiet. She said, I'm gonna learn to read. And she learned to read and uh, she gave that to my mother and, and my mother gave that to me. And even though we didn't have a lot, my mom went into debt so we could have the World Book Encyclopedia in our house to have some portal uh, to information and knowledge. And the other kids all these, had these fun things. They had bikes and, and baseballs, and we had the World Book Encyclopedia, and they didn't appreciate it. But I realized then that despite the pain of enslavement, uh, my great-grandparents learned to love one another. And through that love, create another generation. Despite the terror and trauma of lynching, my grandparents loved one another, and through that love created another generation. Despite the humiliation of Jim Crow and segregation, my parents loved one another and had the, the courage uh, to give to another generation. And what we are seeing uh, on the streets is the pain unmet with the love that needs to come from pain mm -hmm. to give us hope. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think what Dr. Perkins is saying is so powerful. When we have the courage of our convictions, we actually get through the pain. We're not afraid of the judgment that has to be made when we have done wrong. We're not afraid of the judgment that comes when we confess because we know, as we read in James second chapter, that mercy triumphs over judgment. Yes. And when you understand that, when you embrace that, then you run toward that moment and that's what i'm hoping comes from this the anger and the pain is real it is legitimate it should not be questioned it should not be criticized it is a natural expression of of being disfavored and excluded and mistreated and abused but it's not the whole story the whole story is is that through pain through struggle we can still find our way to love and when we love we begin to experience all of that healing that god promises i am a product yes of enslavement and lynching and segregation, but more than that, I'm a product of loving people, God's grace, 
people who found a way to over. And that's why I say to young people, don't think that this moment is too big and too difficult for you to manage. Don't think this is as bad as it's going to get. Our foreparents uh, managed to endure enslavement. They endured and overcame lynching and segregation. I live in Montgomery. I stand on the shoulders of people who did so much more with so much less. I can't ever complain about the challenges that I face, knowing the generation came before me. They would put on their Sunday best and go to protest knowing that they would get bloodied and battered and beaten. And that reality uh, informs my view of what we're seeing right now. And that's why I'm hopeful, uh, despite the complexity of this moment, that many will hear things they haven't heard before. Many will see things they haven't seen before. And when you hear and you see, you can begin to believe and understand, and that will get us closer uh, to, that, to that redemption, that uh, restoration uh, that Dr. Perkins was alluding to. Oh, that, 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 that joy. I'm so joyful that I have went through that now because of the love I feel for my friends. And, and I'm glad I love them. I'm glad I love them. I feel like you felt when your grandmother uh, loved you. We have a young uh, girl here intern now. I tease her all the time. I said, I, I do like, I try, I love you a little bit. Even the more I say that, the more I love her. And I'm teasing her about her love and, and, and the way she accepts me back <laughs> into each other. Love one another. So For lovers of God, I, and that love is going to be from the others. Paul, what kept him going was those Philippian people. You took care of me, not one time, but another time, and another time. You are my rejoicing. I'm glad that I was able to suffer with you. He was having trouble then about whether he was going to die, or be there with them. You know? Yeah. He, 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 he knew it was time. To, he was looking for that joy. But boy, he said, I, 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 I being here with you is better than I don't know which one is the best. Yeah. And so your life becomes a, both a joy of expectation, but it also becomes a joy here when you know that some of the kids who would beat with me in jail, 18 children, every time I meet one of them somewhere, we run up to each other, we both start crying. That we could be beaten together for our cause and still have a desire to be into the life of both blacks and white and others in the world and find that joy. I find joy yeah. in my reconciliation. I feel, find joy. Yeah. Uh, my book, it calls me friend. In fact, that's what it means to be disciples. Yeah. What it means to be disciples is to develop that if we walk in the light, as he's in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, keep on cleansing us. I don't think people recognize the fact that if you confess any sin, in writing this book I'm working on now, I done found an unpardonable sin, mm -hmm. I done found a sin unto death. Those are the sins you don't confess. Mm -hmm. You so embrace them. You so embrace yourself to not being hurt again. That's a dangerous sin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But if we confess it, he's faithful. And he, we don't know, we don't understand that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That hate is really a defense. Mm -hmm. It's a defense. So that's how I feel. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> and, it, 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 and, 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 and that's what I want to do for the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. I, I, I want to be a part of the redemptive program. Yeah. I want to be, I want to make this in my life, my last days. As I said, I turned 90 in a few days. And I'm just so rejoicing. And, and I'm, I'm 
and I've been expecting it. I, I, I don't think people walk around enjoying getting old. <laughs> I'm enjoying expecting what it feels like to be old. And then all the time that he give me now, uh, uh, living with this cancer. is extra. All of that is extra. <laughs> Yeah. So and 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 so I can't wait for uh, on a Tuesday morning for us to get together. Mm -hmm. I'd like to hear something from well, we questions. Got, we, uh, we're gonna ask. Um, make sure that you write your questions in the chat, and we'll uh, select some of your questions uh, in about in a few minutes. But what I want to know is that um, a part of what we need to do as Americans is educate ourselves because we're not getting all the full um, history of America. Brian, you started the um, Legacy Museum from enslavement to mass incarceration. It just celebrated its second anniversary. Um, tell us about the museum and how it depicts um, the history of America. Yeah, well, thank you for that. Um, so in, I went to South Africa and when I was there, I saw um, the Apartheid Museum. And it's a powerful cultural place that tells the story of apartheid. And it tells it with honesty and courage. Challenging place to spend time in because it's so brutal, but an important place. And then when I went to Berlin, I saw the Holocaust Memorial and all of the monuments to people who were killed during the Holocaust. Uh, there's a genocide museum in Kigali, Rwanda. And they want to express their grief so powerfully that they actually have human skulls in that museum. And when I came back to the United States, I was struck by the absence of a place that talks honestly about our full history. Uh, we don't have narrative museums in this country that talk about the reality of slavery. What's interesting in the South, what we actually have are these little plantations where you go and all you talk about are the homes of the enslavers, the people who own slaves. There's almost nothing about the enslaved. And I think that creates a kind of distortion and so we wanted to build a museum that told this story. I, you know, when I go to the Holocaust Memorial, uh, by the end of it, I'm so moved by what I've seen, I'm prepared to say, never again. And we haven't created spaces in America that tell the story of enslavement and lynching and segregation and mass incarceration in a way that motivates our nation to say, never again. We've never said that about racism and bigotry and bias. We've never made that commitment. And so we wanted to create these spaces. And so we have a museum, the Legacy Museum from Enslavement to Mass Incarceration. It's a narrative museum in Montgomery. And then we have the National Memorial uh, to Peace and Justice. I wanted there to be a place, you know, thousands of Black people were lynched in this region, and we scarcely know anything about them. If you ask most Americans, name one of the nearly 6,000 Black people that were lynched between 1877 and 1950. They can't call out a single name. We've done so little to acknowledge them, that we've started this project where we're putting markers at lynching sites where we're trying to get the nation uh, to reckon with this history. And the memorial was designed to be a place where people could really learn about this history. So we have a six acre site in Montgomery. It's actually in the old neighborhood with Dr. King and Dr. Abernathy. It was the black heart of the black community during the 1950s. It was shut down when they ran the interstate through there and that neighborhood died. And so it's kind of fallen into uh, uh, a lot of, of strife, uh, stress. Uh, and so we bought this land and we put this memorial there and we have sculptures and we tell this story. And it's been such a powerful place. We opened in 2018 and we had a, uh, a dedication service on the morning that we opened. And I'll just tell you this quick story. It was it was, I was worried about rain. We had about 25,000 people come to Montgomery for the opening of the sites. And I was worried about rain because I knew that that would disrupt things and I kept just worrying about it. And on the morning of the opening, of the dedication at the memorial, it looked gray and it looked like it was going to rain. I kept thinking, oh God, please don't let it rain. And, and we got inside the memorial, which has a little roof on the interior. And I was so focused on this weather thing. And then finally, I just stopped thinking about the weather and I started thinking about what it meant to finally recognize thousands of black people whose lives were taken, who were never mourned, who were never buried, who were never acknowledged with this violence and to finally be in this place. And I was just there and, and I just felt like God was talking to me and all of a sudden the rain came 
and you could hear the raindrops falling on the roof of that memorial. And they were, and this thing I had dreaded, this thing I had feared, all of a sudden came storming down. But in that moment, it just completely changed. It didn't sound like rain hitting the top of that memorial. In that moment, they sounded like teardrops from all of those who had been abandoned and lynched and forgotten and never mourned. And it was almost as if they were crying tears of joy. And that's when I felt God's grace in that place. And we've been so honored. We've had 750,000 people come to the sites in our first 18 months. We see people embrace those memorials and it's an emotional place, black and white, reckoning with this history. I've been really inspired by what I've seen uh, in these spaces. And it's the reason why um, I'm so committed to kind of creating that. One of the uh, good things that has come from this, when we come out of this uh, pandemic, we're going to try to reopen the spaces in, in, in two or three weeks. And we've now just made a commitment that we're going to actually have free admission to the museum and the memorial for the rest of the year. Because our nation needs to understand this history, as you say, Priscilla, we don't get all the information. And so we are just committed to actually make the sites open for free so that there are no barriers to people walking in and having this experience. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to getting back to that place where we're going to open our doors, which I hope we can do in a couple of weeks. Wow, how, how amazing. Um, the one thing that people do today, and I, I see a lot of questions coming in, is, uh, is there is this thing called white guilt and black outrage. Um, people who are, you know, feel guilty, explain what that means. Sure. I think that oftentimes, uh, it's, it's like Dr. Perkins uh, explained, we are afraid to confront the things that we know are wrong because we don't know how to manage it. We're afraid that we won't be able to survive con confrontation. And so rather than do that, we don't engage, we don't talk, we don't listen, we don't learn. We actually don't seek fellowship, or we do it on terms that aren't really honest. And that actually creates even more tension and frustration. Uh, we, we have relationships, well, some white people have relationships with black people, but they're not real relationships. They're organized around a certain kind of dance and the black person can't say certain things, the white person doesn't say, so it's not an honest relationship. And that guilt, that fear can keep us from true uh, reconciliation, true honesty. And it's been practiced. That's the problem with our country's history. We've been practicing silence for so long. That's the reason why we have all these Confederate memorials and Confederate statues. And uh, it's the reason why we didn't actually talk about the wrong that slavery was. When emancipation came, uh, people just tried to move on. We didn't commit to saying, you know what, all that abuse I subjected to you to, those chains, the assaults, the beatings, the mistreatment, uh, I need to talk to you about that. And we didn't do that. And then even after lynchings, after decades of terrorizing black people, we didn't say we need to confess the wrongfulness of allowing these mobs to terrorize and torment black communities. And then in the 1960s, when we passed the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act, we still didn't confess. People in this region didn't say, oh my God, we were so wrong to, 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 to block black people from voting. We were so wrong to deny educational opportunities. We need to talk about that. We need to convince. We instead just turned the other way. We didn't want to talk about it. We tried to move on. And because we didn't talk about it, we didn't deal with it. And here we are again today, now dealing with over-incarceration, dealing with bigotry, dealing with police violence, and the instinct to do the same thing that we've always done, which is to turn away, because we don't feel like we have the strength and the power and the knowledge uh, necessary to deal with the guilt will get us into trouble again. And that's why I do think God's grace is the remedy for guilt. It is the remedy for fear. It is the remedy for any reluctance people have to confess. And I, you know, and we know in our personal lives, I mean, you know, this dynamic is not unfamiliar. You know, if, if I say something that I shouldn't say that offends someone, if I do something that I shouldn't do, I really want to apologize. It's not just for them, it's also for me. I know that I won't get back to my place of joy. I won't get back to my place of hope and healing unless I give voice to my transgression. It, it, it really is, and that's the thing we have to offer people. We have to let them know. Sometimes people hear me talking about slavery and lynching and segregation and this history and the Confederacy, and they think I wanna punish America for this history. My interest is not in punishment. 
My interest is in liberation. But I know we can't get to liberation. We can't get to redemption if we're unwilling uh, to tell the truth. In the church, you can't just come in and say, I want salvation, but I'm not going to confess to nothing. I haven't done anything more. It doesn't work like that. Uh, we invite you down to the altar. And a lot of people come to the altar crying. They come there fearing. They come there overwhelmed, but they come. And when they get up, the, the, the joy is there. The, the goal is to then be uplifted. And, and that's the dynamic that our nation hasn't embraced. We talk about it in our churches, but we don't talk about it outside of the church. And that's why I believe this moment is so rich. And on the pain and agony of being beaten, as Dr. Perkins talked about, such a powerful testimony. Uh, we need the joy that comes to heal. Right? I've been told so many times, oh, you're wrong, you're not this, you're not that, uh, we hate you for what you do, you shouldn't be representing somebody like that, uh, how dare you come in. I've heard it my whole career. Uh, but uh, when you are affirmed in your convictions, God gives you the grace. Mm -hmm. And I'm proud of every person I've represented. I'm proud to, to go into death row. I'm proud to stand with people who've fallen down. I'm proud to lift up the humanity. I actually believe that all, each of us, is more than the worst thing we've ever done. That's what the Gospels teach me. I think if somebody tells a lie, they're not just a liar. If someone takes something, they're not just a thief. Even if somebody kills somebody, they're not just a killer. And justice requires that we understand the other things they are. And for me, that's good news. That's liberating to, to know I'm not defined by my worst mistake. And so even though we live in a nation that committed a genocide against Native people, that enslaved Black people, that terrorized Black people, that, that segregated people, we're more than those things if we will embrace that. And so that's the good news of this. And for people of color who feel the pain, I tell them, you know, on the other side of that is the joy. We just have to understand how we get there. And that's what's so powerful about, about the ministry that uh, Dr. Perkins has lived his whole life. Amazing. Um, we have a question from uh, Matthew St. John. Matthew, you want to ask your question? Yes, I'd be happy to. Good morning again, everybody. Um, yeah, my question would be, find it here real quick. Uh, what, what would be a, a next immediate tangible step to bring about or to lean toward the re, uh, reconciliation and repentance of which you speak? Uh, clearly, I, I mean, when I, when I hear you, and I, I've, I've heard you and uh, Dr. Perkins speak on these things on a handful of occasions, and there's just this, this deep uh, yearning within me and I know others of us to see these things come about and yet I feel like that when it comes down to the actual okay let's take the step uh that that our society even the church finds itself just kind of spinning its wheels a little bit what how do we stop spinning our wheels what's what's the next thing tangibly yeah. that must happen yeah, I, 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 would, I, would, I would advise three things. First of all, there has to be the education. And uh, we actually produce a calendar at EJI. And we will send as many copies of our calendar to your community as you request. And what it is, is it basically, it tells a story for each day of the year when this history happens. Because we don't know the history. You know, today was the day that Fannie Lou Hammer was arrested and beaten in a jail in Mississippi beaten terribly and most people don't have any memory they don't talk about, they don't have a knowledge of that but when you understand that happened uh, to this courageous woman you begin to get a sense I and mean, you see it day after day after day your knowledge increases your understanding increases we have some other tools we have a documentary truth justice we've been calling a lot of faith communities just to come together and watch the film and get a perspective uh, the movie and all these, the education has to be key. And we can do that immediately, each and every one of us. We can do it collectively and we can do it individually. And then I think there are concrete things that we need to do. We actually have, uh, I was supposed to be in, in Minnesota next Monday. And we were going to have um, thousands of people come together. And we were going to actually um, memorialize three black men who were lynched in Duluth, Minnesota. 
and it's uh, an opportunity to come together and tell the truth about that violence and, and the legacy it has created for this state. Uh, and I think um, the church needs to be at those kinds of events. We do these community remembrance events all the time. Uh, and then the last thing for me is fellowship. If we stay in spaces uh, where we don't interact with one another, where we don't um, learn from one another, then we're not actually going to be able to practice that education we did first uh, to, uh, uh, to respond to that moment of truth telling. Uh, and I think those are the concrete steps. I mean, I really believe that we're in a place now where there are lots of resources that people organize around, can learn from. There are lots of events. Uh, I did a film uh, with Ava DuVernay called 13th that presents this history in a very compelling way. And I just think faith communities need to be organizing events around these opportunities. Uh, Dr. Perkins' book and so many of the resources that he's created are really powerful tools to ingest and then reflect upon. Uh, and then I think it's that truth telling. We actually do a thing where we go to sites and we collect soil from the sites and we put it in jars and we have a museum where we have those on display. Um, that's not something uh, that, that can only be done once. It can be done over and over and over again. And if I was in Minnesota, I'd be asking people to engage in that kind of act of remembrance, a tangible act, uh, and then let that reflection come with it. Uh, but I, I don't think it's, there, there are just so many ways forward. There are multiple. Uh, I think if we have a heart to seek them out, they're, they're, they will appear. They are evident. And I'm serious about the offer of providing you or anybody who's part of the study this morning with this literature, these calendars. We, we do it online as well, so you can actually access it that way. Uh, but if you're like me, I'm still kind of old school paper and I like to see things. Uh, we can send you we can send you the paper version of it and as many copies as you'd like yeah Thank that you. was one of the questions here um how do we get the your information into our, our schools and into our communities um katherine hirschfield also had a question katherine you want to ask yours um i don't think she's on the zoom call but she's on live oh, okay so i can ask I'll it read for it her. um okay so I think she had two questions. Um, one of them, she was saying, you've talked about the need for truth telling about the history, and there are also concrete actions needed to reform policy and rebuilding communities. And how do truth telling and actions present reform, present a reform fit together? And her other question was, how do believers lead a community of non-believers in taking an approach of repentance, given how many people in the wider community don't believe in repentance? Yeah. Uh, well, I think on the first question, there are very specific things that um, I think we can do um, just specifically on this policing question. We have to change the culture of policing in America. I think we have too many police officers that think of themselves as soldiers, as warriors, um, and not as guardians. You know, we train police officers in lots of places. Most of their training is learning how to shoot, how to fight, and how to subdue somebody. And if that's the kind of training you get, that's going to be your mindset when you're interacting with communities. We actually need guardians. We need people who see the role as protecting and serving people, including the people that they are uh, trying to arrest. And we haven't done that. And if you change the culture, which can be done through training and a reorientation, other things will happen. There are a lot of reforms. We, we act like the police are a club unto themselves, not accountable to the community. They work for the community. And community members and, and civilian review boards and community oversight, these are really important tools in helping uh, create the kind of relationship that builds trust. Um, we've surrounded many of these acts of violence with impunity, qualified immunities or doctrines that exist to kind of shield people. I think all of that needs to be eliminated. We have to have accountability for something as important. Just even, even certification and professionalism. There are 18,000 police departments in the United States many of them have no age or educational requirements. There are police departments in this country where you can become a police officer at 18. So we give you a gun and a badge before you're allowed to go and drink alcohol because we don't trust you to drink alcohol, but we trust you to have the badge and the gun and to interact with the public. And that's an absence of thinking about what it takes uh, to be in this situation. You know, the, the police are not like the military. They're not soldiers dealing with enemy combatants. We have a lot of officers that don't live in the communities where they work and that creates distance. 
and that creates distrust. All of those kinds of reforms are things that I think we can implement, that we can adopt, and we can embrace to meaningfully change that issue. Uh, on the question of repentance for non-believers, I actually think uh, even people who do not share our faith have an understanding uh, that you can't just play off your mistakes. You know, you show me two people who've been in love for a long time, I'll show you two people who've learned how to apologize to one another when they go out of bounds, when they make a mistake. If, Amen. If, JP is doing that every day. <laughs> <laughs> but it's just the nature of how you build a, a relationship. Uh, you know, if you if 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 you know if you drive your car up on my lawn and and destroy some of my property, you have to understand that it is not enough uh, to just throw some money down and drive away and feel like that's adequate. You're going to have to engage with me. You're going to have to say something to me. And people know that they have an intuition about it in their personal lives, but they don't tend to think that it applies in their communal and their social lives. And that's why I don't think it's it's that. Uh, impossible to imagine engaging uh, an entire society. I mean, it, it's it's interesting. We actually believe in truth telling in some spaces. I look at what happened in this country on 9-11, tragic, tragic. Uh, and all the people, who, uh, we immediately said, we want to build a memorial uh, to the victims of 9-11. And we've created this space and people go there and they remember and they reflect because they have an appreciation of the significance of that. We just haven't done it in spheres where we need to do it to address these wounds that have existed for centuries. We have a lot of questions about how to address uh, topics of racism. Um, CJ Anderson, he was um, asking, I've been ha having a, such a difficult time with my brothers and sisters in Christ when it comes to the topic of racism, especially repentance within the church. And uh, Taylor Moyer has a question. And Taylor, are you on? I am. Can you ask your question? Um, sorry, yeah. Please, um, uh, about how we respond. Yeah, um, I don't remember exactly how I word. Oh, there it is. Um, how would both Brian and Dr. P respond to people who say they're experiencing reverse racism? Um, a lot of white men on Facebook are doing that. And um, how do you deal with these types of conversations? I think social media is kind of going crazy right now because of that. People arguing back and forth. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I really think we got to, people don't even like the word anymore, um, be patient and tolerant, uh, affirming each other, making each other, greeting each other. Uh, I, I start the conversation in elevators. People don't talk in elevators. I will start a conversation in an elevator and people don't realize, but they'd be happy that somebody's talking. And I'm newly saying something about that affirming us, affirming us right now. You, 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 you know, so I, I, I think that's so, we got to receive one another. We got to be intentional about this. We got to be intentional about our church being multicultural churches. I don't talk about race anymore because it's not but one, and that's part of our problem. The black, the white and black thing is that we have made white superiority and black inferior. What makes us Eco is that we got to get together. We don't prove that in court. Mm -hmm. You can't be separate and eco. And that's the big message that God created us eco. Mm -hmm. So even our language, our behavior, our conversation itself is tainted with hatred and rejection, yeah. Yeah. you know, in life. Yeah. Right. And yeah. what you mean is to kill people with kindness. And um, I think that you said it right. Love is the final fight. And so I like that. Yeah. yeah. And, and could love, I just add love is the all in people don't know this. It all started with love for God so love. 
in 1 Corinthians 13, he compares all of the tools we have, the gifts we have to be successful and to rule this world. He compares that all with love. And if you don't have love, you don't have the essence of God. Love one another, for love is of God. He that loves is born of God and knoweth God. He that loves is not, knoweth not God, because God is love. Yes. Chapter 3 of John, 1 John, is so encouraging to me. It like John just sort of drops, jumps up out of his seat and say, what kind of love is this that we can be called the sons and daughters of God? And that's who we are. And so love is, that's what we're trying to show. That's, what we, that, that, that's the image of God. That's what God looks like. That's how we reflect God in the world, that we love this humanity. And he loved this humanity so much, he came and forgives us for our sin, died for us. That's some big love, you know? I still have trouble with some of my old sins I committed even before I was a Christian. They come before me sometimes. And I have to believe in God more deeper, more deeper. In fact, sometimes I have to be... When I, even when I confess again, I feel fresh again. I feel that he don't wash, he washed them away. He washed them away. So I think we've got to get to this forgiving each other. We, we got the white and black got to forgive each other. We on a suicide mission. Really, we on a genocide mission. We on a genocide mission, we don't change. Because black folks are killing black folk with handguns. White folks are killing white folks with rifles and automatic weapons, and, and they're killing more. So, so we're on a genocide mission. We got to do something about this. The answer to the, all of that is to have the forgiveness of sin. Have, and, and don't, you really can't forgive people for sin. You can start like, almost like uh, confess it, but it is God who forgives. All God is waiting for, for us to acknowledge that we have sinned and he'll forgive us. I think that's a, uh, why the Jews and Arabs can't make it? Why the blacks and the, the, the genocide message is that we, it used to be black and white. Now white folks don't claim the majority against the minority. That's genocide. That's Armageddon. You don't hear what I'm saying. It is not more white folks than there are blacks and ethnics. You hear what I'm saying? Yeah. We're on a genocide mission. Yeah, yeah. If we're going to keep making everybody ethnic uh, minorities, what are you talking about? Minorities is the majority. <laughs> we're talking about uh, um, again. You want to add to that? I, I, I did. I mean, just on this question of reverse discrimination, I think we need to help people understand that when you share, you actually give up something that you have, but it doesn't mean that you get less. When you share, you don't have the same quantity you had before, but it doesn't mean you have less. Uh, and, and I think a lot of people think about eliminating discrimination and bias. You know, if there's an orchard, apple orchard somewhere, only 100 people can go in there. And for 100 years, only men are allowed to go into the orchards. And then one day we realize it's wrong to not allow women to have apples just like men. And we, we decide that we're going to open it up. Well, yes, you're right. Men are going to have the same access that they had before, but it doesn't mean that they're being discriminated against. It now means that they're moved into a space of justice and equality and fairness, and they can take pride in that. It's, you know, sharing is beautiful, not because you get to own as much as you had before, but because when you share, you enter a place of fairness, of justice, of equity, 
of understanding, of community, of fellowship, of reflecting God's grace and love. And that is the reward. You actually get more by having less, by giving more. And that dynamic has to be something that the church has to teach those who feel like, well, we've had 99% of the power, and now all these other people are coming along, and now I only have 90%, and I'm being discriminated against because I lost 9% of my power. That's a mindset that doesn't understand uh, the, the greater glory of creating an equal and just society. And you know, we could spend a lot of time talking about how that 99% wasn't acquired fairly. But the bigger point is, is that when we enter an awareness of who we are, when we actually understand what justice requires and, and sharing requires and mercy requires and equality requires, we get for that a healthy community. We, we step away from that Armageddon uh, that Dr. Par Perkins is talking about. We, we move away from the death and the violence and destruction that awaits us if we continue uh, to act as if only we can be the, the, the caretakers of this fruit. Only we can have access to these things that are valued. That's not a mindset that leads toward uh, perseverance and life and health and love. It's a mindset that leads toward destruction. You go any place in the world where you've seen genocide, and the, the, the things that got people there were these narratives of fear and anger. When we allow ourselves to be afraid and angry of justice and equality, uh, we begin to tolerate things. And so I couldn't agree more with Dr. Perkins that this path of hoarding, of excluding, of keeping for ourselves that which should be shared with others is a path that leads toward destruction and violence and conflict. And the path of sharing, of giving, of opening, of loving, of reaching out, that's the path that leads to the light uh, of love and redemption. That's what we've been called to do as people of faith. The Gospels teach us to be that kind of Christian, not the hoarder, not that Christian who excludes and and claims as his or her own all that there is, but the kind of Christian that gives and shares. Jesus gave his life. He spent his years in ministry giving. The whole, the whole gospels are about uh, our Lord giving to those around, giving to the poor, giving to the sick, giving to those who were struggling and suffering. It's a, it's a ministry of giving. And we have too many Christians that have created a mindset of keeping, of hoarding, of not sharing, and complaining when anyone else and makes that request. That's the mindset that we have to disrupt uh, with our work. And I've heard my father repeat over and over um, this quote, but it's by Anne Frank. Um, no one has ever become poor by giving. Mm. So you become rich by giving. How, how, there, how much time we have? Uh, we have about 15 more minutes. Um, one, le one question from Lydia uh, Vanderselt. This is the last question. Good morning, everyone. Um, it is an honor to be with uh, you, Brian, and Dr. Perkins. Um, this question comes out of being in proximity with um, brothers who are incarcerated a few times a week. Um, but what role does narrative rebuilding or changing the narratives that society places on those incarcerated play in this individual and collective work of reconciliation and um, also in this work of advocacy and working towards this reality best described um, of Ubuntu, that our freedom depends on the freedom of those who are incarcerated? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. <clears throat> well, I, I think many of us subscribe to a kind of restorative justice where we ask people who have offended in our jails and prisons to confront the offense, to not hide from it, to not do your time by uh, trying to forget, but to actually confront. And when we engage in that kind of um, process, then I think that opens the door uh, to rehabilitate. Punishment doesn't have to just be punishment. It can actually be a pathway to rehabilitation. It can be a pathway to restoration and correction and uh, recovery. And that's what I want to encourage. And, and I actually think there are things, and we, we have victim offender sessions where we actually pull people together. And for so many people who've been victimized by crime or lost a loved one, to be able to kind of be in a room with someone who was, uh, was convicted of that crime and, and, and find a way to connect and hear them say, express their grief and remorse. It can be liberating for everybody. And that's the power uh, of restoration, uh, of coming together. And I think we, we, we have in too many states blocked uh, the opportunities we have for that. We have too many prisons that don't let in ministries, don't let in 
a restorative justice, don't create the opportunities that you have to be with. I, I think we all, I, I keep saying to prisoners, you don't have to spend a penny. There's a community of people in this country who are willing to serve and minister and teach and work with incarcerated people and help them find their way forward. And you ought to let them do it because not only is that good for that person in prison, it's good for the rest of us. With, with, with our prisons right now, we lock people up, we warehouse them, and they come out more angry, more violent, less capable of staying out of prison than they went in. And that's the absence of any kind of uh, programming or, or service. And, and that's why what you're doing is so valuable, so important, and I wanna, I wanna applaud you for that and, and recommend it to everyone, the person who asked about what we can do. Uh, you could go to a jail or prison and just be present in the lives of people who are struggling. Uh, prison ministry is a powerful way to fulfill God's, uh, the, the, the gospels uh, in this society. We've got the highest rate of incarceration in the world. You know, our prison population went from 300,000 in the 70s to 2.2 million. Uh, so there's, this country has a, an, a greater need, a greater calling for that kind of ministry than any other country in the world when you look at our incarceration rate. So I want to bless you for doing what you're doing and encourage others to do the same. We're going to, we, this is so absolutely wonderful. This is why we are holding it. Uh, I want you to continue to pray for Vera May. We are be celebrating our 70th anniversary that I've been married to her. She's stayed with me. She's been down sick for the last uh, uh, 18 years and she's living out my life's ministry together. I tell her that every day uh, we we have turned our house into a hostage here, hostage. and we 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 take care of her. Mm -hmm. And uh, so y'all pray for us. I, I'm doing right now with y'all what I really wanted to do with the end of my life. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be able to pass on and and just to think for me to think that I had a little something to do with Brian's <laughs> life. Isn't that something? Amen. And we are, you need to pass that little piece of this on to your kids and people in the community. That which you have heard of me, Paul says, as he's leaving, commit that to faithful men and women who shall be able to teach others also. That's what this is about. Mm -hmm. We want it to be an hour and a half to teach some substance. There are not many places where people go where they get enough substance. You know, it's too short. And we put it early in the morning to start with because we wanted dedicated people. We put it at 530. We've been doing it for a long time so that we would know the people who are here uh, uh, come consistently because they want to be in a place where we teach. Brian, you honor us so much. Uh, uh, and, uh, and Tony, Tony Evans is coming in a few weeks. Look for him. Uh, uh, we're going to have uh, Mark, Laberton, Mark Laberton from Fuller. They got to train these people. We got to retrain the preachers for this day. <laughs> yeah. So we want <laughs> We want to ask, y'all be ready to ask him some questions. Because he can answer these questions and we'll put him on the spot. You got to train these people. They're going to pay all that money. So you got to train them to deal with this situation. We got Judah Smith coming yeah, too. We got Judah Smith coming. He's a technological guy. We got to learn how to communicate. I don't know how many people he's reaching on the net, whatever you call it. It and, and serving those people and looking for ways to minister to them. And this is what this virus is doing, is making us learn how to communicate to each other more effectively. Thank y'all so much. And um, Brian, we want to give you an opportunity to, to give your final thoughts and words of encouragement to, to our audience. What, what do you need in terms of my help? I think you need us to come there. Yeah, we, we, yes. we're coming there. Go yes. Ahead. Yeah, well, yes, well, that's, that's all I would say. So, yeah, please do come and see us in Montgomery. Um, please come to the museum, come to the memorial. We've opened up a, a soul food restaurant. You can even get some food while you're with us. We want you to spend time in our spaces. That's what blesses us. 
And, um, and, and the last thing I just want to say is what a privilege it is for me uh, to have this opportunity with Dr. Perkins. Um, you know, his life's work, his journey, his ministry, his mission, his testimony, that's what inspires me. Um, we have difficult days and I get lifted up by people like him. And um, I'm just really grateful for this opportunity. And I want all of us uh, to support him, to pray for him, uh, to pray for Ms. Vera May, to pray for uh, the Perkins ministry, to pray for those of us in the parts of the country that don't always get a lot of attention. You know, people pay a lot what happens in New York and LA, but there are other parts of America. And when you live in these uh, communities, there, there are other challenges. And so just pray for us. But I would just invite you all to come to Montgomery, to spend time in our sites, uh, to be with us. And then the last thing I'll, I'll say, I do believe <clears throat> that this is a time in our nation's history <clears throat> where many are asking, uh, what does God want from us? What does God require? And the scripture that's on my heart this morning is from Micah in the sixth chapter where uh, many people are saying, well, what does God want? Does he want sacrifice and offering and all of these things? And what the prophet says, no, what God requires, what God wants from us is that we do justice and that we love mercy and that we walk humbly with him. And that's my prayer. That's my hope is that we will uh, take this meditation and do justice and love mercy and walk humbly with God. Amen. Um, Thank you so amen. much. Amen. And, uh, uh, amen. We have, uh, we have amen. also, uh, we, we have some books that we want to, um, we, if you want to order any of Dr. John Perkins books, you can just send, um, send to our info at jvmpf.org if you need any of that and of course you can get um brian by just googling his name and also Amen. we'd like for you to pay it forward to help us to continue our ministry we would love for you to um support our ongoing fight for reconciliation and justice there's our um website you can go to to donate um we need your help and uh and also we have a campaign right now to help our children um who did not get any education this last semester because they don't have computers. 90% of the American children have computers, but over 90% of the kids that we serve do not have computers in their home. So um, help us by going to our GoFundMe page. So we thank you so much for joining us and we look forward to next weekend. We want to um, ask Pastor, uh, ask my sister Elizabeth, would you close us in prayer? Sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Dear Lord, I just thank you for your goodness and your grace, Father. Thank you for this morning and the wisdom and knowledge that was shared with us, Father. I just pray that we um, use what we've heard, be loving and communicate with others who don't look like us, Father. And I pray for our nation, Lord, that we are at a very tense time, Father. And I just pray that you would show us and lead us and guide us in what it is that we need to do at this point. What is our next move, Father? Lord, I just thank you again for uh, Brian and Daddy uh, for just giving, sharing their heart with us this morning, Lord. And I thank you for everyone who's listening. And Lord, thank you all. Thank you for just us being able to um, ask questions and learn and uh, I just pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, Rob. All right. Amen. All right. Attorney, Attorney Stevenson, Attorney Stevenson, can you give me that scripture again? Uh, the scripture. Hey, everybody. Y'all look so beautiful out there. The Chronicles. <laughs> Is it Micah? The last scripture he gave us, Micah? Yes. Chapter, chapter 6, six, eight. Six, eight. Six, eight. Yeah. 6 8. 6 8, yes. 6 8, okay. Yes. Thank you okay. so much, guys. Right. We'll see you next week. Okay, bless you. Thank, Thank you, you, Grandpa. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you, bro. Thank you. Bye, Lydia. Thank you. Hey, Scott. Thank you so much, Brian. Hey, everybody. Thank you. God bless you, Brian. God hey, bless hey. you from Atlanta. Thank you. Bye. This has been very Bye, wonderful. Bye-bye. Love you, Dr. Perkins.
Love you, brother John. Love you, Dr. Perkins. Thank you, John. Yes, we love you. Was this recorded? Is there a recording? Yes. How would we access that? Um, it'll be on YouTube in the next few days, and then I'll post it on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Thank you. Lisa Ross Coco. <laughs>